Emily was up here talking, I was reminded when she was talking about surgery and things like that. And I had my knee replacement surgery. I had a doctor who was new to me. Uh, I didn't know him very well. And every time I went to a doctor's appointment, I would try to strike up a conversation or crack a joke. And this guy had, as far as I could tell, absolutely no bedside manner or no sense of humor. So the day of the surgery comes, and I'm at the hospital, and the guy walks in and he says, hey, I got good news. I read the book last night. I'm pretty sure I can do this. And then, and then on my left leg, he wrote right leg. And then on my right leg, he wrote wrong leg. And then he said, don't ask. And I said, OK, I think I can get along with this guy pretty well. The reason I tell you that is because that was part of his preparation for that surgery, was to put me at ease and to let me know that he wasn't just all business, that he was a, a guy just like us. Uh, good morning, everybody. And greetings and welcome and hi and hello and glad you're here and happy. Uh, it's another exciting day here at Walton Hills Church of Christ. Are you excited? I am excited. I'm, there ain't nothing going to steal my joy. Let's put it that way. I know those of you who were able to join me last Sunday after church over at Ethan and Emily's house were excited. And I know very, very excited to be baptized into Christ last Sunday. If you weren't able to be there and you haven't had the opportunity yet, make sure you welcome them into our family. And we can get the chance to do that. For me, the excitement didn't end there at Ethan and Emily's house because later that day, I just happened to get on some social media and I was looking and I found out that three of my preacher friends around the country also baptized people on Sunday. So if we include Jerry and Karen, I know of at least nine souls that were added to the kingdom last Sunday. That's just within my social circle. I'm excited. It's exciting to me to imagine how many more there were around the world and what exactly was going on in heaven last Sunday. A lot of days. I'm also excited to be here this morning because there was a point in this past week, as John said, when my being here today was in doubt. I was very, very sick. Um, I know some of you have been praying about that, and I'm going to ask you to continue to pray as I preach because this voice could go at any time. I do have bronchitis, but I'm on the bed, and things are getting better, so just keep praying for me. Hopefully some of you were also excited this past week because you finally have the answer to the question that we asked last week as far as it relates to your money and giving your money to the church. If you weren't here last week, go on YouTube and type in Walton Hill Church of Christ and you can watch that message. And if you don't have the internet, open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and read that and you'll find that answer. And, and if you want to just get the answer, go to verse 7 and you'll find that answer there. If you don't have a Bible, you need to come see me after service. And we'll take care of that for you. I started by saying that it's another exciting day here at Walton Hills Church of Christ. And the reason is this. I'm going to give you the answer to another question. Another question that seems to plague many Christians today. Just like the question last week, it's a question that the answer appears in Scripture Boldly in black and white, there's no way to miss it. When I point it out to you, you're going to say, why have I never seen that before? You probably have seen that before, but sometimes we need a reminder. Because the fact is that the answer to this particular question is stated a number of times in the New Testament. Not only in the Gospels, but in Paul's letters as well. And I know you're just dying to know what the question is, right? Here, we'll do it this way. Uh, the question that I've heard many otherwise mature Christians ask is, oh, somebody says I should wear that every Sunday, by the way. <laughs> drum roll? Where's my sound? I can't hear my drum roll. Oh, well. There really was a drum roll there. Here's the question. Am I good enough to get into heaven? Here's the answer. No. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> that doesn't sound like exciting. That sounds like nervous laughter. That should be exciting to us. Because guess what? That means we can quit trying to be good enough to get into heaven. Sometimes we put that in the form of a statement. 
I hope I'm doing this right. I hope I'm living good enough to get into heaven. But today we're going to look at it from the question, am I good enough? And again, the answer is no. But those words up there on the screen right now should be very, very exciting for all of us. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, preacher, why can you tell me I'm not good enough to get into heaven? I'm a Christian, and I should be excited by that? Yes. I'm doing the best I can, and if that's not enough, then what's the point? Have you lost your mind, preacher? I know some of you say that every time. <laughs> and that's okay. First of all, if you're one of the people thinking those things, I just had to put this in here, because my mom used to say, simmer down. Just Simmer down and listen. The reason this is exciting good news, as I said before, is because it's going to allow us to stop trying to be good enough. Now, that doesn't mean I want you to go home and tell all your friends, hey, preacher said we don't have to be good anymore. But if you do, they'll all come to church next week. The pews will be full if they don't have to be good, right? get an understanding of exactly what we're talking about here. We're going to continue our walk through the New Testament. Last week we made a stop in 2 Corinthians, and now we're going to walk on over to Paul's letter to the Galatians. More specifically, I'll be reading from chapter 3 of that letter. You can mark that spot in or on whatever you're going to use to follow along, whether that's a Bible or a tablet or an iPod or an app or the screen, wherever you want to follow along. Again, the question we're going to attempt to answer is, am I good enough to get into heaven? As a human being, based on what I do and how I live my life, am I good enough? Recently, I read a manuscript of a sermon based on Galatians chapter 3, and the author, a guy by the name of Sherman Nichols, began by saying that you have a choice of how to be saved. You can either be saved the legalistic way, by the law, and obeying the law, or you can be saved by God's grace. And I had to read that manuscript to find out if this preacher was indeed teaching people that they could be good enough to get into heaven by obeying the law. And guess what? That's exactly what he was saying. If you could completely and totally be obedient to all of God's laws and never break any of them, yes, you're good enough, but you're also Jesus. Because he's the only one that was able to do that. So at one point, that was possible. Jesus was completely obedient even to death on a cross without sin. Before I confuse you anymore, let's read our first chunk of Galatians chapter 3. Paul starts out with a nice greeting. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain perfection by human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? or because you believe what you heard. Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. What we have to keep in mind here is the fact that Paul is writing this letter to people who have already made the decision to follow Jesus. It could have been written to us. They've already said, I'm a sinner, I owe a debt I can't pay. Jesus is the Christ, the Savior who was crucified to pay that debt, and I accept the gift of God's grace. These are Christians, and based on the author's opening paragraph, they are attempting to maintain the law as the means to an end. Even though God's grace has given me salvation, I still have to do this, 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 and this to get into heaven. It's a means to an end, but what they seemingly fail to understand is that the end has already been written. 
When you are in Christ, the end is already written. Through their confession of Christ and everything that goes along with that, they've already been made right with God. Like I said, it's obvious to me that Paul could have very easily time warped and landed in the 21st century and delivered this letter to the church. There are so many of us walking around thinking that we have to be good enough. The Bible clearly says over and over again that it's by faith we will be saved. So why do we think we can increase our chances by anything that we do? There are a couple of reasons, I believe. One is that we like to hedge our bets, don't we? We like to have a backup plan just in case that grace thing ain't right. That's one reason. Another reason is that salvation by works or by law just seems right to us as human beings. Our good deeds have to outweigh our bad deeds, right? Or, or we can't get into heaven. There has to be some justice. In one article that I read on a website called gotquestions.org, the author said this, our inherent sense of right and wrong demands that if we are to be saved, our good works must outweigh our bad works. Therefore, it is natural that when man creates a religion, remember I said that, it would involve some type of salvation by works. That's the end of the quote. I wanted to use that quote to point out the fact that people who believe in salvation by works have been taught that under the banner of religions that have been created by men. Because every major religion in the world, excluding Christianity, was started by a human being. Only in Christianity do we have a church built on the foundation of salvation by grace through faith. And then somebody's going to say, yeah, preacher, but there are denominations in the Christian church that preach salvation through works. You're right. And the key word there is denominations, which takes us back to the concept of religions created by man. Jesus didn't say as part of the Great Commission, go into all the world and create denominations. That wasn't part of the plan. He also didn't say, teach them to follow all the rules that you've come up with. Jesus said, go and make disciples and teach them to obey everything I, meaning Jesus, have commanded you. Now I want to take a detour just for a second and ask you a question. If I were to ask you to define what Jesus commanded in one word, what would that word be? Love. We have a winner. Love. Love God and love other people. That's what Jesus We'll let that sit right there in your minds for just a few minutes. Don't lose it. Uh, I know we have a habit of doing that. Getting back to our text, Paul's basically asking his readers how they got saved in the first place. Did they obey their way to salvation? To forgiveness? Some people would say, well, yeah, kind of. They had to repent and confess and be baptized and become a new creation. And all of that's true. But before any of that happened, each one of them and each one of us had to hear and believe. Before there's anything else, we have to hear the gospel and we have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. There's no moving forward toward a place in heaven without those two steps. We have to believe that he did what the Bible says he did. And here's the most important part, church. You have to believe that he did it for you. Personally, you. And I have to believe that he did it for me. Because that's the only way it gets. Personal. One of the author's points in this passage poses the question, why would you admit that you couldn't be saved without Jesus and his death on the cross, and then go through life thinking that you have the ability to increase your chance of getting into heaven. What would make you think that? I 
couldn't get started without Jesus. But thanks, Jesus, I'll take it from here. It sounds ridiculous to me that there are many Christians in the world today who are doing just that. Thanks for grace, but I got this. I'll take it from here. I can be good enough. Let's read some more. Verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. And it is written, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Let me read that again. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And some of you are more confused than you were a minute ago. That clearly says that if I don't continue to do everything that is written in the book of the law, that I'm cursed. Is that not what that says? You're right. That's what that says. That's what, this, that's what the second part of verse 10 says. And the first part of verse is what we need to focus on. If we are relying on observing the law in order to have salvation, then we're cursed. Because we can't do it. It is not humanly possible. If it were, there would have been no need for Jesus. No need for the cross or the empty tomb. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. I just said that Jesus was the only one capable of obeying the law, and yet here it says that even he was cursed. Again, it's right. It shouldn't be confusing, because that's the whole point of the gospel. Jesus was cursed because of mankind's inability to be obedient to the law and thereby earn their own salvation. Jesus was cursed by our sin. Somebody had to pay the cost. For the Jews in the first century, understanding this meant remembering the promise of the Savior that had been made all the way back to Abraham. Paul reminds them of that. But to the Gentiles, that's us, church, by the way, in case you're not understanding that. Or if you're a former Jew, then it's not you. But we're Gentiles here. And that would have been much harder for us to understand because they had no concept of a God who loved and who, with whom you could have a relationship. They spent all their time worshiping gods, little g, make sure you put a little g there, Worshiping gods who their only purpose was to appease those gods to avoid their wrath. That's what they did. They made sacrifices. They appeased their gods to avoid their wrath. Unfortunately, there are many Christians today trying to appease God and avoid His wrath. Listen, I know the Bible says that God is a jealous God and that hell is real and that God is a just God and that some will spend eternity with Him and some will be separated from Him forever and ever. I get that. It can be scary. But it shouldn't be scary to anybody who is in Christ. If you have obeyed the gospel and you belong to Jesus, there is nothing to be afraid of. A few minutes ago, I said I was going to leave the thought of what Jesus commanded his disciples and us to do, and I was leaving that thought in your mind. Love God and love your neighbor. The message of Christianity is this. We love because God loves us. That's why we love. It's in response to God's love and to God's grace. We love because Jesus loves us enough that he deemed us worth dying for. Think about that for a minute. Jesus deemed you 
you worth dying for. I think that's exciting. So I'm telling you that once you're saved, so am I telling you that once you're saved, you can live any way you want, still get to heaven? No. And that's a different sermon for a different Sunday. We'll get to that one day. But what I am telling you is that for those who are in Christ, you don't have to live a certain way to make sure you'll get into heaven. You live a changed life because Jesus already made sure you're going to get into heaven. Again, it's in response to what's already been done for you, not in preparation for what you think you're going to get. There's a huge difference. And it's a difference that shows. You live a changed life, not for what you're going to get, but for what you'll be able to give to other people. You live a joyful, peaceful, loving life, not in pursuit of something, but in response to grace. Because His grace is enough. That's all it takes. It takes His grace. So stop trying to do it all in your own strength. His grace is enough. If this message has been personal for you, stop working for your own good and start living for the good of the people around you. <clears throat> that they might hear and believe the good news of Jesus because that's where this all starts. This message was personal to you because you've never made a decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior because you were told you're not good enough. Guess what? You're not good enough, but His grace is enough. So stop worrying about that. Maybe you've been told that. Maybe you believe that. You just aren't good enough. You are good enough. But God loves you so much that He made that gift of grace available by sacrificing his son's life, and then here's the great part, defeating death by raising him from the dead. Opening the door for you to enter your place in heaven. There's nothing you can do to make that happen but lean on God's grace. You have come to the point today where you believe that. We're going to sing, and first I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Don't be afraid or ashamed to come up here and declare Jesus is Lord and Savior because that's what gets you to heaven. Let's pray. God, I love you so much. I am so grateful for your grace because in reality, we are pretty much bumbling idiots at times in our lives that we just trip over our own selves because we won't get out of our own way and let your grace do its job. So I pray that would be our goal each and every day, that we would allow you to go before us, that we would allow you to plan our path, and that we would follow that path, giving you honor and glory, and lifting up the name of your son Jesus, letting people know that without him, we're not good enough either. But with him, we can rely on his grace and focus on other aspects of our lives rather than trying to get into heaven. So we thank you for that and praise you. If there's anyone here that needs to make that decision, Father, I pray the Holy Spirit would just guide them. I pray the church would be accepting of them. And I pray that together we would walk forward as disciples of your Son, our Savior. His name is Jesus. And it's in that name I pray. The church said, Amen. Amen.